No, I'm actually hoping that most people are actually going out for a little bit of a walk and getting some you know, activity in the process. But those of you who stuck around, we have some amazing things to talk about. Uh, my name is Brett Mackiff. I'm the Physical Activity Coordinator at the State Health Department. And I'm lucky enough, somehow I, I managed to rope Kim Klotzing out of Tooele and Travis Olson out of Weber Morgan uh, Health Departments to come join me because they have a lot of the examples of what's really going on when it comes down to what's on the roads and what's in the community and what's happening with the people there. So again, I want, wanted to take a second and just say that this is really about getting you to understand and feel comfortable with accessing some of the health data that's out there. Specifically, we're talking about population level health data. We're not looking at healthcare systems. We're not looking at all the data that's coming out of, say, our, uh, our doctor's offices, our clinician's offices. But what we're really looking at is what's going on in the big picture. So think about your Google Maps and zoom out a little bit. That's where we're going to be. So to get things started, a couple objectives, because that's what we, we like to do, is we want to talk about what's going on with the public health data, what's actually out there, and how can we link some of that to transportation. Uh, we also want to look about some specific efforts that are being made at the local level. That's going to be the adventures coming on after me. Uh, and then also to, for you to have a comfort level and being able to access some of this health data yourself. Because again, we're only going to be scratching the surface here. Uh, why are we talking health outcomes? Really, when we say, what, what the health are we talking about? We want it to come right down to that, that these are specific health outcomes. There are also going to be some determinants that drive a lot of those health outcomes. For instance, as we talk about what's going on on the streets, how many cars are going through an intersection, that's fantastic, and that's important data because that drives how you uh, adjust the, the, the streetscape. But we're looking at is what is that impact going to be on the individual? For instance, if we spend a lot more time in traffic, what are we talking about with stress levels? Amount of time that's spent in traffic is time that you will not be spent doing other activities such as going for a walk, hitting the gym, whatever you do. We're also looking at the chronic diseases that might be complicated by other factors such as obesity and overweight. Now, we're looking at this as truly a, an individual's experience. What we measure is what we change. If what we're measuring does not impact the things that we're trying to change, that's going to be a problem. So as we dig in, I, I really want you to think about what are those long, you know, way down the stream effects that could come from some of the efforts we're doing. So why is health even involved? I actually get asked this a lot. I, I show up at uh, different offices and I hear, why? Public health? This isn't your gig. So my question is, how many of you are in public health? Nice. I think we did. We, we got the band back together. This is good. Usually what happens is I get one hand that carefully raises and says, yeah, I do public health. And I'm surrounded by transportation planners and engineers and policymakers. I love working with them because I want them, by the end of this, to, when I say, are you in public health, I want them to raise their hands too. Because we're all a part of the public health process. Sometimes we're just a little closer to it. So again, the things that we're looking at that are related to transportation. In Utah, yes, we hear a lot about our air quality. That's obviously a big issue. But we also work closely with our injury prevention folks. Because when we get this mixed message that we want you to be out and be active and be healthy and really be doing the things that you need to do, we don't want you to get hurt in the process. So sometimes we hear this mixed message of, well, it's not safe, but we want you out there. And the more people that are out there, the safer it's going to be. And how do we hit that tipping point? Uh, again, we hear a lot about the obesity and overweight issues, but particularly the physical activity that I want to address is that independent of any other factor, anything else, even if you are going to be overweight, underweight, uh, recommended weight, physical activity is going to be a strong determinant of health and well-being overall. Now, what comes down often to this um, and why we do things, truly it comes down to the fact that transportation really is about what we do in, with health and that health is our overall indicator, our outcome for what we're trying to uh, look at when we're saying, why do we do what we do? Now, I need to take a second to talk about Utah's public health system. Now, I, if you notice on here, there's uh, several colors that group several of our counties together. These are our local health departments. These are where the things actually happen. This is where the magic hit is, is happening. Uh, because when we look at local health departments, this is, these are the people who are working directly with the the mayors, the city councils, the county commissions. Uh, this is where we actually see a lot of the policies put into place. Now, 
If you spend enough time watching movies, you usually think public health means you're running around trying to do all the disease outbreaks. That's what happens at the local level. There's amazing things that go there, but there's much, much more. In fact, most of our local health department staff puts on many hats in a day. Uh, so what I also need to uh, demonstrate is that this is not something that the state tries to get into. I don't need to be talking to the mayors. That's not my place. What my hope, my job is, is to be able to help collect some of the data and be able to interpret some of that data and provide toolkits and technical assistance back to the local health department so they can really make the magic happen, okay? That means that we're doing a lot of things of convening groups at a statewide level or sometimes a regional level where we'll try to work um, across big pictures, such as with MAG, with WFRC, and with our other MPOs. Uh, but we also are trying to develop a lot of our capacity within the public health system to be able to address some of these things. That means that I spend a lot of time working with my partners uh, in other state agencies, such as administrative services. This is actually um, some electronic bikes that we're trying to get put into a lot of our state agencies as a fleet vehicle. So rather than you know checking out a, a, a car, we hop on a, a bike and you can have it help you as much as you want or as little as you want. But it means you're out on the roads, you're experiencing, you're getting the feel of what it is to be on Utah's roads. But I want to spend a majority of my time talking about this system here. It's the Indicator-Based Information System for Public Health, or IBIS. So you'll notice that if you go to the IBIS webpage, this is at ibis.health.utah.gov, and I'll have the link on the next page, there is so much information out there. Of the things to look at, the best thing you can do is look at that one that I've highlighted there where it says health topics. These are kind of prepackaged ways of evaluating health data, population level health data that can really impact what you're doing in your transportation planning approach. Now, there's a lot of information here, so let's break it down to something that means something. The health topics page says, let's go ahead and look at those indicators that have been gone through evaluated, make sure we've got enough data so we're not making assumptions that are going to maybe not be entirely accurate based on numbers of respondents or maybe that we need to have a little bit more fine-tuning. These are already prepackaged and ready for you to have and use. You'll notice that we have things from air quality and arthritis, uh, jumping around to mortality data, mental health, injury and violence, infectious disease, obesity and related factors, a lot of information. The part I like about this is, again, it's very user-friendly. There are some other options that you can look at that are a little bit more advanced. In fact, as I go back here, you'll notice it says advanced users on one of the tabs next to resources. Stick with the, the indicators. It's probably a lot easier. That would be my suggestion. And if you do have some questions, you can contact us at the State Health Department or your local health department for specific information. But this is part, oh, please jump in. And I forgot to mention, if you have questions, comments, cheap shots, small logics you want to throw at me, it's fair game, so please. I really appreciate that each local health department does it slightly different of how they give the information out, but they're very good at making sure that the people have the information they need, so thank you. This system is part of a larger national system in which we collect data across some standardized indicators. So that means if you're asking questions about Alabama, you can ask those same questions about Utah and be able to compare. So this is a random digit dial survey, which means we'll call you up, and I'm sure you're always excited to hear from us because it'll be about 20 minutes of, time, of your time to answer all the questions that we go through. These questions can be uh, surprisingly detailed, but they make a big difference in how we use a lot of this uh, to make decisions in our planning process as well. Now, I wanted to show you, in fact, you can see right there at the very top, it's ibis.health.utah.gov if you haven't written that one down. I wanted to show you one specific area. I want to talk about physical activity. So a real simple way, to look at what we're doing here, you can see that there's going to be, right here you've got the old methodology, and I'll explain that here, that we have Utah, and this is for physical activity rates, people who are getting sufficient aerobic physical activity, and we ask a number of questions like this. We have sufficient aerobic, we have sufficient resistance training or strength training, 
We have insufficient, which means you're pretty much getting less than 10 minutes of physical activity that you, you tried to do in a week. That's scary. Um, but this is one that we look at, and we can ab we're able to say, here's Utah, here's the US, and, and looking at it and say, this is great. We're doing better than the national average. Yay, we like that. That's great stuff. But it also, when you look at over the side, you say, but only about half of us, just a little bit more than half, coming up on two thirds, are getting enough. That means there's a lot of us who just plain aren't getting enough. And this number has changed over the past few years because we started evaluating the, uh, who we were asking a little bit differently. We started to call cell phones. We started to uh, get information that was a little bit more accurate and more representative of our populations. So you'll see things like old and new methodologies, and those are all explained pretty clear for you. So, and that's what I was gonna highlight there. Now, you'll notice that on each of these pages, there's all sorts of things, like why does this matter? And I'll, many times we're able to link some of that data to help explain why we collect this. Some of these things we're able to break down by local health district. So when we look at what's going on in Weber Morgan, we can actually look right up there and say, oh look, here we are. We can say, compare Weber Morgan to the state average. Can you guys line up any more closely? And uh, compare it to the national average. We can compare it to the others. My warning is, and this is an important warning, for those of you statisticians out there, what do our wonderful whisker plots tell us? Standard deviation and we get our confidence intervals. This feeling of how much can we assume is coming by chance. Because of this, you're gonna notice that we really have a fairly consistent rate across the state based on what we're able to get. So I wanna take this a little further in and we make a point of not ranking our local health departments and competing against each other. We start to use it as information to say, what are we doing right and how can we make things a little bit cleaner? Uh, just right in there. So we can also look at the actual numbers. Dig in there, have fun with it. Those of you who love to just play with numbers, this is like a dream, it's fantastic. Um, but again, you'll notice the confidence intervals there. Now, we have a little bit more information, just because I wanted to scare you a little bit. This is something what we refer to as small areas. These small areas are often broken down by the level of zip code. So when you're sitting there saying, what is going on in my zip code? When Mayor Skinny, we say, what's going on in my city? We start going, let's look at specifically my area. And we are able to have that same level of, of specificity when we're talking about confidence intervals. There's, there's a lot going on with this. In fact, when you look in nice and close, you're able to say some places are very clearly different than others. So if I were to look at what's happening up at the, the University of Utah campus compared to uh, Glendale or perhaps Sandy Center, we're able to say, yes, there are some significant differences between physical activity rates. That means we can start to align what's happening in our characteristics, maybe the things that you saw with uh, Dr. Ewing's presentation on uh, walkability and measurements of that. We're able to say, here are some specific details about environment and physical activity and all these other factors. So here's my other warning. We make a lot of assumptions. And we make a lot of assumptions because we just, it feels right. Such as, oh, people at the south half of the valley, they just want to drive everywhere. Maybe not. You know, when we do some com uh, comparisons between the avenues and say the west side of Salt Lake, that is a great way for us to say, are we really seeing those differences or is it just something we're assuming? So I do this idea that, you know, question everything, be willing to ask questions and dig in there and see what's really going on. Most of our local health departments have been conducting community health needs assessments or community health assessments to say what's really going on and not only the numbers, but why are we having these issues? For instance, I know, uh, up in Davis County, we had a fantastic community health assessment that got to really dig in and ask questions of why are we physically active and not, why are we not physically active? And they did some qualitative work to really dig in on that. And we're gonna, I think, hear from Travis about some of those as well. Uh, we've thrown in some state added questions to say a little bit more detail. So specifically, we wanted to know what is the story going on with active transportation in Utah? So we asked, the, again, we think about this as a really big network casting here. And we asked, in the last month, how many days were you walking 
to or walking or biking to school or church or other destination other than for recreation. Purposeful walking. We got kind of excited about this. We're like, we're going to get so many. It's going to be awesome. And then we kind of cringed for a minute. We realized that zero days was way up there. But this was walking. And this was super helpful because we were able to say, now we know uh, statewide. Because, again, this was, this, there wasn't enough data on this one to be able to say at each of those small areas. But we are able to say statewide, in general, we don't do a lot of active transportation. We are currently working, and we've got some proposed questions, to see if we can get this at a specific level, at a small area level across the state. So we can answer this question, how much are we using active transportation in our zip codes? We asked the same question about biking, which kind of surprised me. Um, apparently, we, we don't like to bike as much as I thought we did. So I, I, I think the big part is, is that we have created a lot of really good environments. In some places, we've worked really hard. Salt Lake City has got some fantastic examples. Davis County's making some fantastic improvements. Uh, up in Ogden, the River Morgan area, beautiful. I was just up there a couple weeks ago and was totally blown away. Going through the feel of what it was like to be active in different cities throughout the state. Um, what I wanted to point out is that there are some things that are going extremely well and it tends to be those things that are cultural shifts. So again, while we see these numbers and they may tell a story, oftentimes the story that we don't get out of the numbers is the more qualitative. And we start getting experiences. So as I'm driving around and I'm sitting there at a light, I'll look over and I'll see a vehicle next to me that has a couple of bikes in the back of the truck. I'm like, oh, this is pretty cool. Well, I'd say, what's really going on there? As I zoomed in, this was the Mosquito Abatement District. And they're out there and they've got bikes with them to do their work. I was thrilled. I'm doing cartwheels. I mean, I drove by them like, and they're like, oh. I'm, yeah, I'm that guy. It's one of those. But we are in a process where we're seeing a major culture shift. And what happens is that the culture shift happens, and the numbers tend to start to show. So I think while we have data, this data is going to be able to be extremely useful to you in your planning efforts. I also want that to be representative of what's happening in the future. So we're, we're lagging a little bit. Now, our physical activity data in particular is only captured every, uh, only on odd years. So we've got another cycle coming up. So we, we kind of lag a little bit, but this still can be used to help you with your planning process. I would be horribly remiss if I didn't get into some of the health equity issues. Now, the reason I bring this up is that I see a lot of promotion of bike lanes and other amenities in rich white neighborhoods. And yet where I work, it is not that way, and it's quite the opposite. This is actually right down the street from my office, and I, saw I see this guy all the time. He, he rides his bike, and he's got, I don't know if you can see it, but a shopping cart that he's pulling behind him. I said, the most amazing, innovative bike trailer I've ever seen, and I was so nervous he was going to tip. It, was, it made me freaked out. But I see this all the time, and I see people who are doing this because they have to, not necessarily because they want to. And so as we're making our planning efforts, the use of this data that we have is really well set up to make sure you're addressing some of the health, health equity needs. And I know Travis is going to talk about this, I think, yeah, I think you're talking this as well, about how health equity drives a lot of our decisions and the data is used to drive that. Uh, John F. Kennedy made some fantastic comments about physical activity, and I just put as an encouragement that physical fitness is not only one of the most important keys to a healthy body, it is the basis of dynamic and creative intellectual activity for not only the people who are doing it, but for those of us who are trying to make it work a little bit better. So I'm going to step away for a moment, hand this over to Kim, where she can talk about some of the things that are going on in, in Tuella. Well, thank you all that are here, because I know it's kind of hard in the afternoon to be here, because uh, you're a little bit sleepy, and you want to check your emails and make sure that everything in the office is still going well. So thank you for coming. Um, I love what this leads into, because um, you know, the data that we get from the Utah Department of Health really helps us on the local level. Um, these pictures right here, um, I, they were uh, a month ago. Um, when it talks about active transportation, um, the one on the top, that's me swimming, that used to be the old Ute Trail down by Gunsight in Lake Powell. And um, it was amazing to walk through that and think that the old Ute Trail was used by people hundreds of years ago. and to think of the history that went through there and, and, you know, people passing through, packing stuff, going down to the Colorado River. It was just amazing to think about that. But also, you know, was 
was that the most efficient use of, of you know, the area and stuff like that? And then, I don't know if you see the stairs over there. Those are, those are called the miner stairs. And uh, some miners made those down uh, by the Colorado River. And they used to pack their, uh, their pack mules up there. And they carved them in the, in the sandstone down there. So we went and visited that. So, you know, was that the most efficient, you know, use of those paths and trails? And obviously, we don't use them anymore. So <laughs> we want to take the data and we want to put it with the most efficient use of trails. So that's where the local health departments kind of step in. Um, I hope you all are familiar with where Tooele County is. Um, it's 300 miles out and 30 miles back, as Stedman says out there. Um, we are on the other side of the Oakers. We're not that far away. Um, it's that picture was taken by one of our local commissioners of the valley this spring. So that's just right up on one of our trails, one of our walking paths. Um, Tooele County um, has been reported to be the third fastest growing um, area in the state of Utah. Um, we're projected, I think, to hit 100 to double uh, within the next 15 years, I believe, Jeff. So 15 years, we're supposed to double. Um, the hard part about our county is we've got 30,000 people that become residents of the other areas on the other side of the mountain during the work hours. So they commute back to their homes at night, but during the work hours of the work week, they are kind of citizens of the Wasatch Front. So um, you have to realize that we have some statistics and data from the census to help us understand our community. Um, in the fall of 2011, the Tula County Health Department met with Tula County and the Tula City leaders collectively identifying the health needs in the community and determined the um, areas that our public wants to focus on. So we take the data from IBIS and that's collected by the State Health Department and we know where there's areas like we can take the zip code and stuff like that where we have problems, but we also need to take it out to the community and see what their perspective is and what, what they view as the problem and the health problems in their community. And uh, a lot of the things we use is IBIS, but we also use other collective data. And that's what we want to let you know is that health departments are there to collect data and on health and information, and, and it's there for you to access. Um, we're there to help you. and. Uh, that's what we're there for. And so um, we're trying to help our community, but we're also trying to help our, our city leaders and our, our commissioners with um, things that they um, need help with as far as development. Um, so the priority areas that um, Tula County came up with was obesity, substance abuse, diabetes, physical activity, and access to health care. Other concerns were air quality, traffic, infectious disease, and mental health. Um, with the IVIS reports and the reports we get, so in 2008, um, Tooele County unfortunately had the highest rate of obesity within the state of Utah. So um, is there a correlation there between how many people drive out of the county every day and with you know, that rate? There very well could be. And we've kind of tried to figure out you know, if there is, and, and we still are. There isn't all the data out there, but there is a correlation. Um, so with knowing that, uh, Tula County was able to get some funding to help us with trying to get an active community. And uh, so with the State Department's help, we got extra funding to help us with that. So that is the EPIC program. So some programs were combined at the state level. And so that's where we get our funding to help out our community to become more active. So when we received the funding for that, um, being identified as one of the most overweight communities in the state of Utah. Um, we, as the local health department with our health officers and with our community, um, came up with a coalition that is trying to reshape our community. And so we work with the data information, but we also work with the information we get from our coalition to, to address the need. Um, so we're reshaping our community, so the healthy choice is the easy, easy choice. And then also up here, whoops, let me go back. Up here, um, bridging the distance um, of supporting physical activity in rural communities. Um, Tula County still is considered, it's on the verge of urban rural. Wayne, it's urban rural, right? Kind of, it's bouncing back and forth of, of that. But um, 
studies have found that there is some um, inequities with um, the um, urban areas having access to biking, walking, paths, trails, and things like that. There's areas out in our community, we don't have sidewalks. I mean, there's areas where the kids walk to school on dirt paths that have been there probably since their parents walked to school, their grandparents, and maybe even beyond that, walked to school. So um, there is some inequalities that happen with that, but we're trying to address that. Um, so with all this information we've got, the health department got extra funding to try to help address the community needs. Um, we've also been networking with other agencies, and um, one of the breakouts I went to, it had a bunch of different, it had UDOT there, UTA, and it said, the best thing we can tell you is networking with each other. And I tell you, you know what, that is. It's working with each other. That's, that's the best results you can get. And so um, we've been working with national parks and we've been trying to get um, some mapping and trails up of our area and our community and we're trying to branch out into the smaller areas. Um, we do studies to try to, UDOT's helped us with studies to see if we can help air quality, trying to get underpasses, trying to get different paths. So there, I mean, there's a lot of data that we're collecting and we're trying to help our community become healthier. Um, Live Fit Willa County, um, we're trying to get people out and interested in our community and becoming active. So we've got this thing called Summer Adventure and like the kids can participate and get these dog tags, the parents can participate and they can have chances to win prizes. Senior citizens can do things where they, um, you know, have a chance to win prizes too. But we're trying to get our, our community out and seeing what there is available, but we also kind of want to have their input on what they would like to see out there and further it a little bit more. Um, we've been uh, working with UTA and UDOT and just trying to see if we can get, you know, biking paths first and last mile because we do have some buses out that way. We're seeing if we they need bike racks. So this is how we use the data that the state has helped us with. Um, also, uh, we just updated our general plan, and I'm really excited because I was able to work on that, and it was um, input of active transportation into our general plan, so it was really awesome to see that input and, and to see the, the county, you know, see that as a need. It was also put into our transportation plan. And so we were able to try to come up with some different ways for Twila County, the rural areas, to have walking, jogging paths. Um, some of our areas have coverts. I don't know if you guys know what coverts are, but they are, they are not curb and gutter. <laughs> they're, they're ditches. So <laughs> we're trying to see if we can get some policies passed where on one side they put a covert, but the other side they at least put a graveled path that our kids can walk on. So with the data we get, you know, we're trying to see if we can set these in motion. Um, we are working on trying to get some um, biking paths. That's the first one that's officially striped in Tooele County. Um, UTA helped with that. That's in Tooele City. And actually, that is our accountant at the Tooele County Health Department. He gets on his bike every day and rides around. So it's really awesome to uh, see that not only we, you know, talk the talk that we bike the bike. <laughs> anyway, so um, we are working on policies um, for our community, for planning. We're trying to network with um, active transportation paths. Um, we're working on policies in the workplace, in the schools, in businesses, with all the data that we collect. And then I just want to say this is my pie in the sky hopeful ideas that I would like to see. Um, it would be really neat if we could have a biking and walking path from the Great Salt Lake Marina to um, Stansbury Park. And I say Stansbury Park because that's kind of the first community that you run into. And um, Stansbury Park supplies water to the Great Salt Lake Marina. So if some of you know how that works, there's usually a right of way for the water that goes that way. So it would be kind of nice if, if we could do that. And I know I've talked to George about that before. <laughs> So I keep bugging people that that's, you know, maybe when I'm 80, I'll get to write it one day, but I'm hoping for sooner. So anyway, that's just kind of showing how we take the state data, we put it into local form, and how we kind of, you know, make it work and happen, and we hope happen. So anyway, let me turn the time over to Travis. Hi, how are all of you? I can't speak. 
so I just wanted to get to know you a little bit better. Brett asked about who, those who are from the health department. How many of you, if you could raise your hand, are part of the planning, are, are a planner, city planner, otherwise? Great, so we've got three of you. How about engineers? Do we have any? Okay, perfect. Do we have any elected officials? I know that we have you. Okay, great. Anybody else? What are you? Architect. Awesome. With who? Okay, great. All right. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, thank you for all coming today. It's nice to see some fresh faces, not just health professionals, which are great, but we want to be able to expand this opportunity and talk about the link between transportation and health. So I'm going to talk about that. Um, talking about the how data connects transportation and health, and then also a tool that is, is great and marvelous and I am passionate about, and then talk about how we have taken that data in a specific instance. So I work with Weber Morgan up in up north. So Weber counties, Morgan counties for you that know, pretty interesting population. We've got two distinct populations there. We have a, kind of a higher income area in Morgan, and then Weber is Ogden, and, and uh, there's North Ogden, South, South Ogden, downtown, different demographics in there. So it's an interesting thing. But first I wanted to connect the dots with data. Wanted to start with this little graphic, a process. Just talking about, so there. this is simplistic. There is many links perhaps, but I just wanted to talk about that as transportation planners, engineers, whoever we are, to definitely think about design factors such as safety and e equitable access. We've been talking about equity and making sure that we really focus our efforts on helping people, for example, minorities that can't get to places to be physically active, for example, they're not they're right next to a freeway and they're not able to get across that barrier and then of course people feel like they want to use active transportation if they feel safe so it's important to think about those design factors and then that hopefully will influence the behavior of target populations that's a word we use a lot of target population so really we have limited resources and time and we want to put it where the money matters and again equitable access to those priority populations that have disproportionate uh, health outcomes. So that hopefully will increase physical activity when we create, we talked about the environment, um, Mr. Norris talked about the environment and personal responsibility. Well, when we do these transportation, we're creating an environment. We, have, we as health educators help try and motivate people to be active, which can be hard. as I'm sure most of the health educators can attest. But that hopefully will increase their physical activity levels. And another thing I want to just bring up is that it can also lead to opportunities. People, for example, who have lower income jobs, when there's transit now available, they may be able to take that and go to a new place and apply for work and get a better position. So as a result of that transportation, now you see that the behavior can change and then the result are these health outcomes over time that we have decreased obesity, decreased prediabetes, diabetes risk, and perhaps changes in socioeconomic status as people move up the ladder. Okay, I love this tool. It's newer to me, but it's called Community Commons. How many of you are familiar with this? Awesome, we've got two. People. So this is good that we're talking about this. Mr. Norris actually sat on the chair for this organization, so I thought he was going to talk about it, and I was a little bit nervous, but he didn't, so I have a chance to, to talk about it. So this is an amazing um, GIS platform, and there are so many data sources that come from this. That's what I like. It's not just one data source. It, it's pretty user-friendly. They say not in every instance, but I'm still exploring and getting new to this, but some of the examples, I just want to list, I'm not going to say all of them, but the U.S. Census, the American Community Survey, which is distinct from the census, it's taken more than every 10 years. Anyway, and then there's a walk score, there's USDA, there's the Department of Health and Human Services, Dartmouth, I can't say that, Dartmouth Atlas of Healthcare, the National Environment Public Health Tracking Network uh, through the CDC and others. So when you go on to this, 
communitycommons.org. Yeah, I highly re recommend it to anybody. It is not all caps, it's all lower case, so. So, when you go to the site, you can view a report. So, actually you can build a report. But So what I did is, at the home page, you can select build a report. Then you go to this maps and data tool, and this is a community health needs assessment like Kim was talking about, that you can even select by county. So I selected Weber County, of course, because it's the most important county. And then I clicked view report. Now you see that you have a lot of different data indicators here. So demographics being one, I just wanted to show you an example. So we've got, of course, total population, but we have it by age, we have it by um, gender, we have it by disability, which I'll talk about, limited English household, limited English pro uh, proficiency, veteran population, urban and rural population, lots of data that you can look at. But then you also got these social and economic factors, again, like Mr. Norris was talking about, then other areas. So I focused on population with disability because I wanted to show, again, that we want to be reaching out to these target populations that are disproportionately affected by diabetes, obesity, et cetera. So you'll see here that this shows the total population in Weber County. It actually compares that with that of the state rate and the nation rate. So we're doing, basically we have more than Utah, but less than the nation rate. Anyway. And then you'll see this map here, and right there here is the title of that map. These are, so this is county level data, but then you can break it down by census tract and often zip code, like he said, the small areas. So when we go to view larger map down here, then we're able to see it by census tract. It's pretty neat because you can see here our dis disabled population over 18% reside in this area in downtown and then up here. So we're able to focus our areas and should focus our transportation areas on those that are the most disabled. Why? Because they need access to services. They need to have those opportunities available to them. Another example of a measure that's in there is walking or biking to work. Again, Weber, oh, again, Weber County right here. Um, We've got over 4% workers traveling to work by walking or biking by census track. So I actually was, so one, one to four, that, that looks like really impressive, but one to 4% isn't that, that much. I clicked on viewer, uh, view a larger map again. And then this is neat, oh, because you're able to, I, let me go back. So you're able to click highways here. So for you planners, then you'll be able to see the major intersections and then state boundaries, county boundaries. There's so many things that you can put levels on this and map it out so that you see, oh, these people are working or are disabled in this area and there's also major intersections. How can we help them and what transportation alternatives are there available to them? Now, if you hover over one of these, then you're able to see the tracked information. So it'll give you the exact rate, not just kind of a, a range. Does anybody have any questions about this yet? <laughs> Maybe you will in a second, but. All right, I wanted to close by talking about how we and Weber Morgan have used Complete Streets and Roy and how we use data to come up with Roy as our priority population. So like this says, we received funding, like Kim said, from the CDC through the state to do this healthy living grant. And the goal is to intervene to prevent type two diabetes as well as hypertension. So again, our target population, we were asked to find the general population or adults who are at, had high or uncontrolled uh, hypertension rates and were at high risk for type 2 diabetes. And then on top of that, I think we learned a little bit later about the, <laughs> but the special populations as well. Those people that are experience the same things but are at higher risk. 
they find CDC that Hispanics and blacks are higher, at higher risk for type 2 diabetes as compared to the general population, as well as hypertension. So we here at Weber Morgan, we looked at the data through these following indicators, pre-type 2 diabetes, pre-hypertension rates, ethnicity and race. And I just am excited about public health because we're trying to prevent things from becoming a huge issue down the road, basically. And the levels of analysis, cities and small areas, he talked about small areas kind of, again, zip code kind of a thing. When we looked to determine the top cities, Ogden population has about 84,000, 30% Hispanic. Pretty important to, to note that. And then Roy also, 37, 13.5%. Those were our top two cities. With our African American population, Ogden had 2.2%, and then Washington Terrace was next with 2.1%. We also looked at six small areas that were included in the IBIS system, actually, and then took that along with the small area, pri pri I can't speak, sorry, pre type 2 diabetes rate among those aged 18. 18 to 64 and found that Roy Hooper, and it is Hooper, it is not Hooper, um, and Ogden, those were the highest rates. And then same with the city hypertension rate, Roy, Hooper, and Ogden. So again, got those from IBIS and CDC, so you can see how we arrived at our conclusion of what our target populations were. Those, definitely Ogden, definitely Roy, and Hooper. So this is just a map of where we're at, we were county, this is Roy, this is Ogden. So Roy, we, we love Roy because it's our target population and how we went about it was interesting. So one of our coworkers found out about Wasatch Front Regional Council's workshops where they teach about complete streets. How many of you are familiar with the concept of complete streets? That's great. Basically, it's designing streets for all users and for all modes of transportation. That doesn't mean that every street's gonna have all of that but where it's appropriate. So we entered into a contract. We said, hey, we're gonna give three cities $5,000 and they will take that, the, the council and the wor workshops that are there for the complete streets and then we will uh, work with them for, for data purposes. We had them apply, have an application process, and North Ogden, South Ogden, Roy, and Washington Terrace, so there were four communities that responded. We sat on the selection process just trying to help out, and we were excited because Roy was chosen. Ogden was not, but that's okay. It was, can't force the cities to to, to do this, so they, they put in their um, applications and then we helped them select these three, Roy, North Ogden, and South Ogden. So we're so happy about that. So we were able, I hope that in demonstrating this, so that when we had these complete streets and they're actually implemented, that they'll help with physical activity rates and it'll help people be more mobile and then hopefully will lead to less obesity, less diabetes, and an upward socioeconomic trend. That is how transportation and health can potentially work together through the data that we have. Okay, so this gives us a, a, a big picture. Where are we get some data? And I was overly simplistic when it came to BRFSS and the whole IBIS system. Um, the reason I was is because it gets really it's possible to get really buried in it. And I'll tell you right now, there are days when I come up and look up and I've been working on it for hours thinking, oh my. There, this is not the only way. The community commons is a fantastic option. If you're in Salt Lake, there's uh, the healthysaltlake.org website, which utilizes a lot of the same data. In fact, probably would be um, easier to use in many cases because there's also some things that have been highlighted as priority areas. Um, we have things in the IBIS system that's not only for adults, but also for kids. We have a lot of our state added questions. The, the best part is, is that we have, there is no Darth of data, I'll tell you that. The question is, how do we make it work for you? 
So what I hope now is that you have this, this big picture and you're so excited to go delve into all the numbers, but even more so, you're willing to communicate and work with your local health departments and state health department for some of the data purposes. Uh, we have some time to go through and, and just dig into some questions, uh, pick their brains, figure out what's going on. Um, I think the chance to throw objects is over, but questions or comments are more than welcome. Yes, please, George. I'm so glad you brought that up because in my excitement, I did not mention one of the projects that we're working on with several partners, quite a few people and organizations, uh, to address the economic, environmental, and health benefits of active transportation. We're in the midst of that right now, doing some assessments. We should have that by the end of the year. And once that comes out, oh, I'm excited. It's going to do us some good. So yeah, the ROI data that we'll have, um, we'll be able to share, take it right back to our councils and mayors. and. Uh, yeah, we're swinging. finding that that's so important that the economic impact of active transportation is, is a seller for a lot of the cities and other mm -hmm. makes sense. And if I had one wish, one dream, when we were writing what uh, Tyler had said, our little piece of paper, it was to be able to say that physical activity linked with active transportation is going to have more of an impact than a lot of things we're throwing a lot of money at. So this, this is a chance for us to really turn things around and make it uh, impressive. Other questions? Come on, we're not that good. Fire away. Yeah, so there's actually tools on there that I was in, there I could have shown a lot, but there are tools that link that report to other places. Walkscore.com, I believe it's .com, is assigns a walk score based on a number of factors for a city or for an area. So Now, I will make my own comment on that. Walk score is a fantastic thing if you're using it algorithm, algorithm style. For instance, it will look at your proximity to a grocery store. It'll tell you your proximity to a school, and it'll factor that all in. So you'll have an, a... a Calculate a walk score, and then you can do a, speci a specific one for your area by answering some additional questions. So it's on a scale of 0 to 100, 100 being a walker's paradise, and everybody can walk, and why would you have a car? In fact, we, we mock you if you have a car kind of a thing. To 0 where, good luck, it's not going to be pretty. It gives me, in my, uh, where I live, a fantastic walk score. Unfortunately, what it doesn't capture is that I have zero sidewalks, and that, yes, I am within a pretty close distance to a grocery store, but for me to get to this grocery store that's a mile away, I have to travel about seven miles um, because of the way the roads are lined up. So use walk score with caution. Um, be willing to do the calculated walk score as well, which is on their website. Oh, there's so many yawns. This is great. I, come on, I had charts and graphs. This is exciting. Nothing says fun like a chart and graph. Any other questions? The ways that perhaps public health can work better with you? <laughs> I wish we had the ability to focus it in on you. <laughs> This is on a rolling basis. It's always being asked, so it's it's never stopping. The data we just collect over the years and mark it off in different points. Yes. Yes. With some additional state added ones and some adjustments. Yeah. Minor. Um, we use it all the time. I, I have my one of my epidemiologists in the in the back and. If you have questions that are of detail, I'm going to pull her up, but she may not like me for that. Excellent. We have at the State Health Department an all-player claims database, which gives us the ability for every uh, submission, any kind of a procedure that's done that is submitted to like an insurance company that comes into the system, and it, there's a lot of processing. We have it. We're still in the process of getting good at it. There's a lot of questions we don't have answers to yet, but we're getting better at it. 
Uh, we also are lucky to work with a lot of our uh, clinician groups. Uh, we have we have really good relationships. We're working with some of the electronic health records as well, being able to get some of that. It's it's a long process. Thank you for understanding. <laughs> We're excited, and I'm positive I'm upbeat. We can do the thing. This is great. But it's going to take some work. And I think one of our, our challenges is that there's a wealth of data in the the uh, physician and healthcare provider world, which is very, very different from our population. And we are always working with them to make sure that we're all saying the same thing where we can. You guys are talking yourself out, you know, into an early uh, departure here. So unless you've got any other questions. One thing I failed to mention, sorry. Please. It's, it's a voice from the above. person that keeps it going, but I did want to mention, I failed to say that our complete streets, they went through those workshops, but they're also developing policies. So whenever this, whenever they're designing a new street, for example, they have to take those into consideration. So it's beyond just a workshop, it's an environmental and policy change that hopefully will do a lot of good in Roy, North Ogden, South Ogden. Okay, well we will stick around. You can tell our, uh, we've got our information up here. Please contact us, and if it's not us, contact your local health department, or just be in touch, because we're, we're happy to work with you. One of the main goals that we have set up within at least the EPIC program, which is where I am, uh, is to ensure that public health has a voice because we have a lot of data to help you with so you don't have to go through it. So we're there to help. Make sure you ask us and we're excited to work with you. And thanks, you know, Travis, Kim, thank you for your time on this and I uh, appreciate you joining us.